Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Film Club Podcast, where every month we deep dive into a different aspect of cinema, director, genres, actors, or franchises. It doesn't matter, because it's always fun at the Film Club. I'm Dean. I'm Boo. And this month, we're talking about horror comedies. And this week, we're talking about... Young Frankenstein. That's right, Young Frankenstein. Or the Frankenstein. Fr- Frederick, Frederick. Frankenstein. It... This is a Mel Brooks classic through and through. Yes. It stars Gene Wilder, Marty Friedman. Madeline Kahn, Peter Boyle. The killer's row of the Mel Brooks mm-hmm. cast. This comes out in 1974, same year as Blazing Saddles. Still wild. This, yeah, it is the year of Mel Brooks. Um, But do you want to just like open up with, we can both agree this is a great comedy, canonical top 10 of comedies all of all time. time. Yes, yes. Yeah, like we'll we'll just spoil it here. We both really love the movie. Very much so. It's also kind of a hard movie to talk about because of that. It's going to be hard not to quote everything from the movie. Yes, because it's a very quotable film. But um, I, I'm curious, when was the first time you saw Young Frankenstein? Oh, jeez. I mean, this movie's been a part of my life since I was a kid. So who knows? I could have been four or five. But this is also a great movie to show kids because... It's not scary. It's not, I mean, not that the regular Frankenstein movie is scary. It, it's, uh, the Frankenstein movie stopped being scary many, many years ago. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of a thing where if you want to get kids into horror, it's kind of like watching, um, an Abbott and Costello. Yeah. Where there's a lot of physical humor and it's like, oh, ha ha. You know, I don't have to be afraid because Frankenstein's dancing. It's, yeah, that, that, that's one of the best gags oh, in the yeah. movie. The other thing is the movies. The movie is really good to show kids. I saw this when I was a kid. Uh, like also, I told people I saw uh, Blazing Saddles when I was like very, very young. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna be honest. I was a little too young to see Blazing Saddles, but this was like the double feature with it, and yeah. I'm very glad because I quoted this movie instead of Blazing Blazer. Saddles yeah. at elementary school. But yeah, Young Frankenstein. This is definitely a movie that is pretty the movie's pretty horny there's a lot of sex jokes in it but they're very like double entendre will go over a kid's head who's not paying attention it's smart humor yes like it's it's not very like lowbrow like crude it's just it's very witty and i tried to get ariel to watch this i recommended the title to her and she goes oh no it's too scary and i'm like i'm like it's not a horror movie even though it's shot to be looking like a classic horror film. Honestly, that's one of the most impressive things about the movie is the production, is the look of the movie. Yeah. Because it's all black and white, and I know that was a huge sticking point for a lot of the producers. A couple of studios were like straight up, no, we're not doing this. We don't want to do black and white. I think it was Paramount. Like he tried to get this made Mm -hmm. of Paramount, and they straight up shot him down. Yeah. They said they either you do it in color or you just don't make the movie. And I think they did that at Warner Brothers too, and mm-hmm. eventually Fox said, "Yeah, sure, whatever." Let's do it. The whole look of the movie is just fascinating because it looks like a Universal monster movie. It has the iris wipes that mm-hmm. came out of Vogue in the seventies. Uh, it has like the still camera. There's no zooms in the movie, which got really big in the sixties and seventies. Yeah. It's it's a very fascinatingly well-made movie for a mel brooks movie even with a painted castle on the hill yes the matt uh, you gotta love a good matte painting you gotta it looks straight up out of dracula uh i mean isn't this frankenstein though it is but the castle in you know this movie and in dracula are just remarkable <sighs> great castle for being fake oh, so fake so fake so great so great uh but yeah um before we get in too deep let i'll give everybody something i haven't given them in a long time the back of the box. Wow. I know. I don't even remember the last time you did a back of the box. It's been a while. I usually, I, I think I changed up how I'm going to use the back of the box. I'm going to use back of the box for movies where the plot really doesn't matter. <laughs> not, well, I mean, not that, that it doesn't matter in this movie, because this is basically Frankenstein. Just, you know, his great, great grandson, great grandson. It's his grandson, but for some reason he's going back to his great grandfather's estate. they Look, it, the, there's a lot of plot holes in this, and that's kind of the gag of the movie, yeah. is all the Frankenstein movies have plot holes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, like, the point of the movie isn't really the plot or the story, as it were. The point of the movie is how funny Frankenstein can be if you really give it a shot. Oh, yeah, but we're still following, like, the progression of what would have happened 
And Frankenstein. Yes. But for those who don't want to, you know, watch the whole movie or, you know, get it all spoiled, here's the back of the box for you. Because the movie is about a brilliant surgeon who is called to his ancestral castle and while there uncovers his grandfather's works on raising the dead. But this now new obsession drives him mad and soon he loses control of his own creation as it tap dances across town and just, just, you know, ha- tries to live his best life. Tap dances into the hearts of all of us watching. Can I just state something that's kind of sacrilege and you might uh, get angry at me for oh, saying? Oh, Lord. Let's go. Okay. I think Peter Boyle is might be one of the best actors to ever play Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. I love Peter Boyle. Yeah, I know. But I think he might be better than Karloff. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, the mo- I, uh, 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 But it is. It, I think it's the whole thing where I understand this is a parody. I understand Karloff mm. made the role iconic and his performance is dramatic and all those other things like i understand that but god damn peter boyle can play frankenstein shtick so well oh yeah and when he does the monologue at the end i'm like <laughs> oscar moment here you're cutting onions I'm over cu- there <laughs> i'm cutting onions over there it's it is like so good i wish i wish like call off had a monologue that good and like bride of frankenstein oh lord Hey, I mean, Karloff had the tears when the bride rejected him. Just tears my heart out every time. Every time. Every, every time. time. But um, we belong dead. Your your favorite part of cinema eh. is is that your top? Is that one of your top five moments of cinema? Is uh, the fall of Frankenstein and the bride? No, I don't think so. It's it's got to be up there because you you reference that a lot. Well, because I love Frankenstein. And horror movies. Yes. You also, and universal horror. You also love comedies, and this is I a do. comedy. Yes, I do. But we mentioned before, this is in the canonical comedies of all time. Mm-hmm. I think this has been on like every single one of those top 100 favorite comedies of oh, all absolutely. time. I know it's on like uh, the AFI top 100 site. The top 100 comedies of all time, I think it's like number 15. Uh, this is definitely in Empire Magazines and time. all those like, you know... Um, big list big list this shows up if you narrow it to comedies and it makes it hard for me to kind of t- approach a little bit because you know there's a lot of baggage around that being like don't be scared i'm not that scared but it, it's a thing you know because i haven't seen this movie since i was like a kid right and Which i was just shocking well you know you think about it like i watch a movie new movies all the time you know i don't revisit movies very often uh but this movie... Time Bandits? I love Time Bandits. It's classic. I I think it's been like three years since I've seen Time Bandits. I'll go back to it. But Young Frankenstein, it's one of those movies where I was kind of afraid it wouldn't hold up. Mm-hmm. I was kind of afraid that, okay, made in 1974, maybe a joke in here is not going to land well 50 some odd years later. And I was very happily surprised that, no, every joke works. Every gag works. Gene Wilder is the the best uh re, like double take man in all of Hollywood. Marty Feldman is still funny, mugging at the camera. Like, no, all of it's good. All of it's good. I have nothing more to say. It's just all good. Boom. We did it. Exactly. Yeah, you you finally got me to just unabashedly say, Yeah, no, this is good. I've I've that's it. Like, go watch the movie. It's so hard to get that information out of you because usually, no, you know, this could be better. Oh, this hasn't aged well. I like my movies aged like a fine wine, even though I don't drink wine. I mean, I've had a glass of wine every once in a while. But no, this is one of those movies that has aged tremendously well. Yes. And I think the reason it's aged so well is because its connection to Frankenstein and the Mm -hmm. kind of eternal revisiting our pop culture has with Frankenstein, right? Like every couple of years, somebody remakes Frankenstein. Yeah, because I'm I'm sure, I'm sure, between 74 and the 90s, Frankenstein had to be revisited because I'm thinking the next big Frankenstein is the De Niro one. Well, yeah, there's the the De Niro one in the 90s with like Kenneth Branagh directed, Mm -hmm. but there's like the Hammer Frankenstein movies that were all over the 60s and even into the 70s. There is definitely adaptations of it throughout the 1970s, Mm -hmm. 1980s. They were just probably lower budget movies because it's public domain. But 
I think the reason that it's, you know, aged so well is because the iconography that it is making fun of is basically eternal iconography. Yeah. Everyone understands Frankenstein at some fundamental level because it's so kitsch and so ingrained in our pop culture that even though, you know, when I was a kid, I never saw Frankenstein. I had no fucking idea what what that what Frankenstein was. Wow. wow. Again, when I was five. I know wow. you started at three. Like five or six. Uh, yeah. But watching it as a kid, I'm like, I'd never seen Frankenstein, but I understood it. You know, and it's like, oh, well, he's like the guy with the bolts in the neck and there's the weird hunchback guy. Because like I watch cartoons, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's the thing about this movie that's made it last and so endearing is that it's pinned down on like one of the most culturally significant pop culture films of all time. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like like Spaceballs, like why that movie <laughs> is gonna yeah. always be funny is because it's lampooning one of the biggest pop culture touchstones of all time in Star Wars. Absolutely. But I just can't believe you didn't, you know, know Frankenstein off the bat. I was five. Hey, I mean, you've told me some of the questionable movies you grew up watching and I'm like, oh, you oh, watched yeah. you watch that, but you didn't watch classic horror? I mean, I got around to it when I was like eight or nine i guess i thought you were gonna say like 18 19 <laughs> I'm like oh. damn oh yeah I, I really came to frankenstein that late yeah no like i was i got into like this movie is probably what got me into like classic horror movies because i remember i think i remember this you know i see this movie when i'm like five or six and mm-hmm. i think when i'm eight or nine i get to see frankenstein for the first time and i was surprised it wasn't a comedy Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's the thing. This movie really colored my thoughts on, like, what a Frankenstein movie would be. And then when I watched the movies that this was parroting, I'm like, why aren't these funny? Like, what what's up with this? And then years later, I realized, oh, no, they are funny. They were just different kinds of funny. Yeah, and I mean, I'm still in shock that, you know, it took you so long to watch Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. You watched that. When did we do that? Last year? I think so. We, I watched it for this podcast. I had never seen an Abbott and Costello film before. I I had only seen the who's on first bit like brah you know where have you been these movies are so iconic and even you know with this movie where it's a parody it's satire it's just a really well made movie like top to bottom it's just so so much attention to detail is put into it not even like a a comedy writing aspect because it's wonderfully written it's incredibly funny top to bottom but the production of it is insanely high caliber Oh, yeah. There's more deep cut references in this than the legacy sequels they make now. Like yeah. this puts like the tech, the Netflix Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie to fucking shame. Well, this a lot, puts a lot Hall- of movies could put that movie to shame. Well, okay, but this puts like uh, Halloween 2018, where it's just filled top to bottom with references to Halloween. This goes. There's way deeper cuts in this than in that whole trilogy. Because, like, because what is it? They actually, you know, people are like, oh, well, they got the original mask from, like, Halloween. It's going to show up in the movie. Mel Brooks literally got the original production designer from the 1931 Frankenstein to get the original props from that movie to use in the lab. I mean, I was going to drop that bit, but, you know. I mean, it's it's a pretty hard bit to miss. It is, but, you know, you took it right out from under me. Just like when you used to copy my notes way back in the day and you'd, you know, you'd knock them out there and be like, hey, you know, I found those out. I wrote those down. I, I came to them organically. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But yes, you know, he did. He met up with uh, Ken Strick Fadden, who still had all the the laboratory set from the 31 film. Which is fascinating. I figure a lot of that would have just gotten scrapped in the 30 years, 40 years since. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, still to this day, you know, they'll tear down a set, but things are saved to be, you know, preserved for museums or whatever. Usually it's for another production, especially back then. That's probably why they never tore it apart was, you know, well, it's just going to be in another mad scientist movie. We'll hold on to it. Or he's just like, no, man, this took me forever to build. I'm going to take this home and keep it in my garage. And then Mel Brooks is like, oh, you still have it. All right, if you let me use it, I'm going to give you a screen credit. Because apparently they wouldn't give him a screen a screen credit in the first film. Yeah, well, that's because credits worked way differently back then. And I think if you were part of, like, um, productions or things like that, you're, you weren't credited, but the head of your department was credited. Mm-hmm. So even though he literally built and did all the sets, like, 
the head of his production department, which whoever they got the credit for the whole whole thing, which you know kind of kind of shitty. Yeah, we changed that eventually, which is good. But yeah, like that's one of those things where that's an incredible feat because it he didn't have to do that. No, he could have just built that. It would probably would have been easier. But the attention to detail that is is fascinating. The fact that most of the movie, even the village they shoot in, is a pretty accurate recreation oh, of yeah. the 31 film to make, so it feels like there's a cohesive through line. Because, I mean, they could have tried to go back to Universal to shoot in um, uh, Little Europe. Mm. That's a set where, it's not the original set, it burnt down, and then it was rebuilt to look like the, the original, original set. set. So it's like they could have done it, but no, for this movie, it's pretty spot on. Everything feels very organic. It doesn't feel like, you know, ooh, they're trying too hard to make this look like Frankenstein. It's like, no, we're we're in that universe. And I think that's why this works as um this works better than a lot of the like the legacy sequels we get now is that it's not doesn't look like it's trying too hard. I mean, it they're trying. They're trying real fucking hard like behind the scenes, but on screen it's like, no, this is just a nice organic story. They don't, you know, nudge nudge wink at the camera when anything you know shows up where you're like isn't that the guy from like the 31 movie but now he's like grown up as a villager well i mean we can't say there's no nudging or winking at the camera because we do have marty feldman that does it a couple of times where he breaks the fourth wall and just kind of you know winks at the camera or you know interacts with the audience that was a thing that mel brooks and gene wilder had a lot of issue with because mel brooks wanted to be like in the movie as a real character and, and gene, gene wilder Wilder's said, like absolutely not because he breaks the fourth wall and he would break the illusion of the film i think yeah. is what he said so then he got Mar- marty feldman who he does it it's different because mm-hmm. there's a different context and a different feel when he does it than when mel brooks does it and is I is Igor like does he have the most like killer jokes in this movie? Oh, absolutely! Like per capita, like yeah. he's just he's everything he says is a fucking like like closer. It's all good shit. He's sinking baskets every time he drops a line. Every time, you know, uh, it's a thing where it's like I don't want to just tell people all the jokes in this movie because we would just be here for its runtime. But we could sit here for the runtime just quoting. We yes. could probably recite the movie. Yes, yes. Now. The other thing that's, you know, really fascinating about the movie, you know, is that cast, because we mentioned it, it's a killer's row of uh, Mel Brooks regulars, you know, you know, Marty Feldman, you know, he's, this is like his only movie with Brooks, or is this is one of his like two movies he's done with Brooks? He did um, Silent Movie. That's right. Yeah. Everyone always forgets Silent Movie is what comes out after this. And it's a good movie. It's a good movie. It does, it does not do as well as Frankenstein and Blazing yeah. Saddles, which you know, it's to be expected when the first, you know, when your first three movies are all nominated for Oscars and two of them are the biggest hits of that year. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to follow that up. But yeah, Marty Feldman, great in this movie. We she also can... have Terry Garr, who plays Inga. Yes. And she's kind of new to the group because, like you were saying, a lot of these people have worked with, um, Mel, I would say Gene Wilder, with Mel Brooks before. And she was kind of like, the new kid on the block. Mm-hmm. Well, her and uh, Peter Boyle, because these are—I think this is the only movie they've worked with Mel Brooks before. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Those in which you know they come in and do great work. Again, I think Peter Boyle is one of the best Frankenstein's ever. Oh yeah, he's up there. But it's interesting, you know, that he still brings back Gene. Like Gene Wilder is obviously going to be in the movie because yeah. he helped write it. Mm-hmm. But he also brings back Madeline Kahn, who. I always forget is has very little screen time in this. Oh yeah, she's just like a blink in this movie. Yeah, well, she shows up a lot at the in the third act, but her combined screen time of this ninety minute movie is ten minutes. Well, I mean, compared to High Anxiety or not High Anxiety, Blazing, um, Saddles. Blazing Saddles, where she's in it a lot more, mm-hmm. and then High Anxiety, she's the co lead in it. Yeah. And, you know, it's also interesting we don't see Mel Brooks in this at all as a character. He he does a voice, right, for Victor he, Frankenstein? He, yeah, he is the, the narration is Victor, and then he does the voice of the cat that gets hit by the dart that we don't see. <laughs> of course he does the voice of the cat. And then I think he does the, the sound of the werewolf. Mm, okay, that makes sense. But, so he was like, any way that I could kind of, you know, slide into the movie a little bit, I'm going to do it. 
it's it's good stuff honestly the but yeah the whole cast top to bottom is great yeah i mean marty feldman he's the standout Mm -hmm. of course and i think peter boyle is the one that's the most surprising as being you know as good as he is for the role he's given Well, i mean you know the character arc on him yeah we go from dead to living (laughs) man again it's a character arc from i went from dead to alive a harder role than being alive to dead anyone can do that oh yeah but yeah like there's a real character arc there. There's a real character arc with uh, Gene Wilder's um, Frederick Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, and I really, I really like Gene Wilder in this. I think you mentioned when we did Blazing Saddles that this is his best performance. I think I would agree with that. This is probably his best movie or his best performance. Yeah, because we get, you know, another character arc from him, too. Mm-hmm. He is the very straight-laced surgeon, you know, kind of... He's... rejecting his um, destiny or his ancestry no escape that's for me <laughs> but we see him kind of be like the straight man in the beginning and then as time is passing by we're seeing you know more personality and more humor and just craziness i think that's kind of the genius of his his character and arc in this movie is at the beginning it's a very uh, f- honestly for the first like 20 minutes it's a, there's jokes in it but it's pretty like straightforward yeah. like there's nothing like too ridiculous there's nothing like blowing your mind it's all like good honest shtick but it's played straight we don't see him break until he finally meets igor yes and when that when igor shows up that's when it's like okay now this is that mel brooks heightened reality mm-hmm. That's, the, you know, the Blazing Saddles, the High Anxieties, the mm-hmm. Robin Hood uh, Men in Tights, where his movies have this heightened reality that are like living cartoons. Like, that's the Mel Brooks style is everything is like a Warner Brothers cartoon. Yeah. And as it goes on, um, Gene Wilder goes from a normal human being to a cartoon. And it gets progressively more cartoony all the way until the end. Yeah. And... It's it's just a well done, well performed role, you know. I again, I can keep praising this movie, but it's you know, it's it's just true. it deserves it. It really does. It really does. And I mean, you know, because this this movie has a uh, has deserves a lot of praise, but and it was even nominated for like two Oscars. Mm-hmm. It lost them both because uh, it was nominated for sound and screenplay. Of course, because you know, it's a horror movie. Oh. No, no. Okay, so here here's the murderer's row that came out. So this is Young Frankenstein in 74. Oh god, it's it's going to is this going to be a bad one? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So here you go. So this movie lost out to, you know, sound and screenplay, but here's some other movies that came out in 1974. I want you to just tell me when I hit a movie that you think might be a little a smidge better than Young Frankenstein. So what came out in 1974? Godfather Part 2, Chinatown, uh, The Conversation, Day for Night. A Woman Under the Influence, Murder on the Orient Express, also Blazing Saddles, just throwing it out there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all those were nominated for Oscars. Uh, We also have uh, the Blazing Inferno. We have Earthquake. Yeah, you think a little bit of a murderer's row of films just kind of hitting out in 74? It did, but I'm still standing on my hill that uh, Young (laughs) Young Frankenstein is still the number one movie. It was hard to say that was a straight face. Do you want me to bring up, you know, young Al Pacino in Godfather Part 2 so you can tell him that Gene Wilder's the better actor? No, it would be uh, young De Niro in Godfather Part 2. You would would have to tell him that Gene Wilder's a better actor? When we get the whole Vito Corleone story, oh man. Yeah, I'm, I'm still standing that Young Frankenstein's the best film of 74. And that hurts because I love Blazing Saddles too, but I, I'm going to, you know. You, should I, should I, Jack Nicholson's right over there. He's in Chinatown being like, really, you like, you like Gene Wilder better than me? Is that your Jack Nicholson impression? <laughs> no, that was just my sad boy impression. Because, I mean, uh, you love Chinatown more than I do. I do. I, do. I understand Chinatown is like problematic now, but God, that is such a well-made movie. It is so good. God damn, Chinatown's a good movie. But, like, this I'll, was a I'll, rough year. I'll, I'll die on that hill that this is my number one for 74. Okay, I understand. But you got to admit, oh, this is a rough yeah, award season. Yeah, that's a rough one. And we've done so many episodes where these are big movies, and then we go to the Oscars, and it's like, holy crap. 
It was the, just like, man, how many big movies came out in that year, and we w- missed it. Wasn't that the one where where we did uh, Gods and Monsters, another movie tied to Frankenstein, yes. where we were like, oh, yeah, but it, it won Best Screenplay. What came out that year? <laughs> and then we like, oh, well, Best Screenplay <laughs> was a pretty weak category. Well, what about Ian McKellen? Who'd he lose to? And it's just like Tom Hanks, Tom Cr- It's just a murderer's row of all-time yeah, performances. Yeah. And you're like... Well, fuck me then. Or when uh, we did Page Master and it was like 94 and we're like, <laughs> how did this movie get lost in the shuffle? Oh, Lion King came out that same year. Oh, well, uh, pack it in, boys. Not only did it come out that same year, Disney was like, yo, you want to, you, wanna, you know, kind of kick Page Master? <laughs> they re-released it against Page Master just to spite him. Like, oh, wow. Oh, that bully. Was bully. <laughs> big bully. Big bully. But that, that's the thing. You know, critically, the movie's, like, way better received than Blazing Saddles is. Yeah. Right? Because Blazing Saddles even is even viewed as controversial in its day. And that's why. Because people don't understand that Blazing Saddles is a satire. And this one, they're like, oh, okay, I, you know. I think people understood it was a satire. I think people thought it was in bad taste. Or the critics thought it was in bad taste. Not everyone thought it was satire. It's kind of the same boat that people are in with The Great Dictator. Where they thought Charlie Chaplin was praising Hitler. And he's like, no, I'm making fun of him again it's like we 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 went over this in the blazing saddles episode we did you only get that take if you've never seen the great dictator yeah you only get that if you don't watch the fucking movie yeah but blazing saddles is like kind of the same boat you only think it's serious if you never watch the movie but this is way more critically lauded than blazing saddles is yeah but uh in terms of you know box office take i'm i will just say in you know all those movies godfather chinatown conversation this movie dunks on them in terms of box office take oh yeah people were going um i've seen a documentary about the movie where when they were doing the test screenings they were crowding the theater it was like you know standing room only kind of people showing up to come see this and it was just like yeah People wanted this movie before this movie was even out to the the mass public. Well, it's because Mel Brooks had just come off of Blazing Saddles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that movie made a shit ton of money. And it was like a huge crowd pleaser. That movie dominated drive-ins for like months. And it's like, oh, this guy's coming out with a new movie at by the end of the year. I want to go see that. I, I watched the trailer for Young Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. In, in the trailer, and he's like, brought to you by Mel Blazing Saddles Brooks. Come see <laughs> Young Frankenstein. And it's like, okay, like, he was on top of the world here. Oh, yeah. You know, like, the producers nominated for, like, Best Screenplay Oscar. I think it wins Best Screenplay. In, in uh, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein in 74, two of the biggest grossing films of that year. One critically lauded, one big crowd pleaser. Well, both are big crowd pleasers. Like, the guy basically wrote the check for his entire career off those three movies. Like, he he could have retired after this, and they would have said comedy genius for the rest of all time. I mean, the man just had a birthday recently at the time of this recording, and he's still working. Yeah, still producing. Yeah, I mean, uh, was it History of the World Part Two on Hulu? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was part of that. I was like, damn. Yeah. It's like, this man does not run out of ideas. Oh God, no! Honestly, it's a thing where we've we've mentioned before that we really want him to make another movie, and you know, you're he's ninety seven. He doesn't need to. It would probably like be really rough, but you know, it'd be nice. And who knows what it would be? But it would probably be awesome. Probably, but yeah. Um, this is a little bit of a short episode. It's just so hard to talk about this because it's the same with a lot of comedies we talk about. This movie just deserves to be watched and talking about it doesn't do it enough of a service because there's so much comedic timing here there's so much production things in which that are just so like wonderful to experience i mean walk this way yeah yeah i didn't didn't aerosmith uh do something with this yeah apparently they were watching the movie and i guess steven tyler was inspired by just that line and then he wrote walk this way one of their biggest hits yeah I mean, it's a line that I love to recite all the time because it's just, it's just funny. And then my nephew earlier this year got me to actually do it. I actually got to walk this way. He handed me a bubble wand. And Cause, had you because he, the thing. you know, he's he's three, and he hands me the bubble wand after he was walking like you know, looking like Gandalf with his you know with his staff. And then 
he hands it to me. So I start to do it to, you know, to appease him. And I'm like, huh, he finally got me to, you know, <laughs> I got to walk this way just like Frederick did. I'm like, this is awesome. It is awesome. And they wanted to cut or Mel Brooks wanted to cut that scene out of the movie. Really? That's he, like one of the first like Igor gags. Yeah, but he thought it was too corny, the, the walk this way down the steps. And I'm whoever, if it was Gene Wilder or someone else, told, no, you got to keep it. I am forever grateful because that is a, a great gag. It, I mean, it feels like the movie, this movie feels like it, there's a bunch of deleted scenes in it. Oh, yeah. There was a really wrong, a really long runtime for this where I think it was like two hours 30. What the fuck? And him and Gene Wilder had to sit there and they had to cut it down, trim it down. Because I guess someone had watched it and they're like, mm, you know, the the vibe is... At two and a half hours, this kind of drags a lot. Yeah. So they were like, yeah, if we had kept it at 2.30, it probably wouldn't have done as well. But at the, what are we, 90 minutes for this it's movie? It's like 97, I think. I'd have, I'd have to look it up. But it's definitely like closer to a tight 90 than two and a half hours. Yeah, because I mean, the movie moves fast. Yes. And the pacing is great. It doesn't feel like, oh man, this scene has been going on for so long. It's like, no, we're we're moving fast, but it's not like um Blazing Saddles, like I mentioned Blazing Saddles felt longer than its runtime. Mm-hmm. It was still funny. It just it the setup gags, payoffs, the pacing of it yeah. were just played longer. Mm-hmm. And in this, it's a lot of a it's a lot more of a tighter film. And I think it's, you know, there's no wasted jokes in here, but I'd be interested to see what this hour of deleted material would be. Is it just more gags? Is it more plot? I'm not too sure. Um, it's probably on the DVD. There's probably, because I have the one of the older DVDs, so mm. there's probably a good amount of just deleted scenes, uh, extended scenes. I feel like with most movies that I really love, I want more Yes. But with this, I feel like this is just perfect. I, there's probably a good reason those aren't in the movie. I mean, one of the best things about the DVD is that they have the bloopers. Yes. And I mean, the the bloopers are great because they are so funny on camera. But just to see them mess up and to be themselves, it's just like, okay, that's just an added bonus to this great movie. I'd be... <sighs> It's one of those things where I'm always surprised to see Gene Wilder do these movies and just have him keep a straight face for all these. Because mm-hmm. I think um, I think he, has, he plays the straight man so well in this. Even though he's kind of like a maniac for half the movie, it's really just well done. Speaking of Gene Wilder, you know, co-writing the movie, helping, you know, create this masterpiece, he also helped bring in Gene Hackman. Yes, that is um something that always fascinates me about this movie is that Gene Hackman is in the film as the blind hermit. And, you know, he's under a bunch of makeup. You can't really recognize him. But I'm like... Oh, you can recognize him. I mean, a little bit, but I don't... You couldn't put that next to a picture of 1973 um, or 72 French Connection mm-hmm. Gene Hackman and be like, these are the same men. Can't you tell? No, he's under like a lot of makeup and it is like wild that gene hackman is in this yeah because apparently him and gene wilder used to play tennis together and i guess gene wilder was telling him oh you know i'm working on this project and gene hackman's like i want to be a part of it i don't care what i do you got to help me get in and they're like i think they wrote him in as a uh, the, the blind man which one of the best scenes in the movie one of the best scenes and the reason why it cuts away to black so fast at the end, when Frankenstein goes running out of his house, you know. And he runs out, and he's like, what? I was going to make espresso. That was, you know, kind of just thrown in by Gene Hackman. Mm. And apparently the the people on the set just erupt into laughter. And they were like, okay, we got to cut it right here because like, everyone. Like, we can't recover. We can't recover. Everyone lost it. He filmed that in like a couple of days. And I was just like, you know, just when you think you already have a big cast, because we forgot one of the most important people in the cast, Cloris Leachman. Yes, as Frau Bluka. Yeah. Bluha. <laughs> I also, that's a gag that I never realized was funny until years later when I found out, like, oh, Frau Bluka. Bluka means glue. That's why the horse is nay. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh, that's one of those, like, like low key kind of like you got to know about it kind of mm-hmm. jokes. I, I don't like that's That's a good one. That's a good gag. Well, I mean, it's just like uh, when they're. When Frederick is creating 
Frankenstein when yeah. they're when they're doing the sketch and they're you know okay we want to make him into a bigger man so he's got a you know big hands big this and you have Inga you know I'm not gonna repeat it because I'm gonna butcher it you know when she's like he has to have an enormous you know butch- schlonger yeah and then you know when you translate that no that is the correct verbiage so that's when you have you know Frederick kind of react like oh well, yeah yeah I, I, I guess he would and it's just like you know it's these little things where if you don't speak the language it's like Oh, okay. I, it sounds, you know. I mean, it's also not a subtle thing where it's just like you know what she's talking about. You she's holding she's talking. a sausage when you, she you, says it. You know what she's talking about, but then it's like, oh no, you actually are using the word. Okay, I'm like, there's a lot, like you said, a lot of attention to detail in this movie. Yeah, and it's it it all serves the and it all serves the plot of the movie, and it all just works so well. I know we like said oh the plot of the movie is just that eh, doesn't matter it's a parody it's you know that well you said it doesn't matter i said well, it, it matters because it is following the footsteps of frankenstein but we're kind of seeing it in a more comedic or farcical way cartoony way yeah like i'm not saying like oh the plot is useless this could be a, a series of sketches and it'll work the same no 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 the plot matters it's just the plot of the movie is kind of like this perfect structural thing like this could just work as a normal frank if you removed all the comedy from it it would just work as a normal frankenstein mm-hmm. movie this would be the perfect you know frankenstein five return of of uh frederick or something <laughs> this would work as an as a normal frankenstein movie but you insert the comedy into it and i think that's kind of the beauty of this film this is like a proto airplane where you know, the Zucker Abrams or whatever, mm-hmm. their movies work because they are normal, straightforward plots. Structurally, they are normal movies. Then the world is just ridiculous. This is kind of in that vein. This is like a proto airplane where, no, this is like if you laid it out, it is a functional three act structure, real movie. And then you just insert all the farcical elements on top of it. And I think that's that's like a, a very hard thing to do. Because a lot of people try way too hard to make their movies funny, and it just ends up feeling weird. And cringe. Yeah, you know, there's like a whole decade of cringe humor that I'm not a fan of (laughs) uh, in film. And then we have this where it's just this really well thought out and done mixture of comedy and homage. Yes. Which, man, like homage films now feel so... um, lazy and i'm and i'm looking back on this and i'm like god damn it we figured it out in 74 why is that so hard to do it in 2023 yeah because i mean in 74 this is not a lazy movie this is a lot a lot of attention to detail and Mm -hmm. to make sure that this looks like you belong in that vein of the classic monsters this honestly could work Mm -hmm. as um if you were to marathon the Frankenstein movies and you watch this one last or after Son of Frankenstein, this would almost just fit in like a like one of the sequels. Oh yeah. Like this would this just kind of works in in that canon. But where we stray away from that canon of the, you know, traditional Frankenstein movies, we got a musical number in this. Yes. I don't remember um, there ever being a musical number in Frankenstein, Bride. I haven't seen Son. Have you never seen Son of Frankenstein? Because I don't want to end it. I don't want it that to be, you know, that's it. That's Karloff's last, you know, Frankenstein. This movie is far more a parody of Son of Frankenstein than it is of Bride or, or 31. I, I, I can't. I just can't do it. You, Not yet. You, I, you are I would, doing a disservice to yourself. I, I would have to do it for the podcast. That, that's the only way I'm going to get myself to watch Son. Guess what we're watching next week, ladies and gentlemen. No, no. <laughs> but we get a musical number. And I had talked about this a little bit in Elephant Man. Yeah. Because, you know, at the end of the movie, they're at the theater. And I kind of felt like this was the same in Elephant Man. Because just the look of the theater itself, I was kind of like, oh, wow. I wondered since Mel Brooks, you know, what was he? He wasn't. A, he, he was a producer on Elephant Man. Yeah, he was a producer. So I was like, I wonder. Like, There's that word out there. It's well, really important. I was going to say director because Mel Brooks is usually the director. And I'm like, well, no, that was all about David Lynch. <laughs> So yeah, it was, it was just, a whole David Lynch month. Yeah, that that whole, you know, month about that guy. But, you know, apart from the look from that, we get the musical number where, you know, he's introducing his creation to the crowd and showing them, hey, he's not bad. You know, look, I, I've trained him. And he, he can does do this. putting on the Ritz. Yeah, and he's like, okay, 
he could walk backwards and forwards. And then we're going to cut the lights and, you know, we're in tuxedos and we're ready to dance and sing. It It is probably one of the best gags of the movie. And it is it is a it is a reason to watch the film because that setup and payoff in that moment is hilarious. And you've got Igor that's playing the piano for them. I didn't even notice it was Igor until like this viewing. Yeah. I also didn't realize that Frankenstein has a zipper on his neck. I always thought it was a stitch. No, that's why you know when um, him and Elizabeth, you know, spoiler, the the monster gets a girl in this movie. She calls him Zipper Neck, and when you look at him, yeah, he's got a zipper on the the side of his neck. Yeah, well, I never realized that as a kid. I just noticed it on this watch, and I'm like, oh, that's just weird psych gag. Or when they're about to like um, take, they're about to like revive the monster, and Gene Wilder's in like his surgeon gear, mm-hmm. and you notice that he has a sewing thimble on his finger. Yeah, because he just got done stitching up, and I'm well, like, this, yeah, and I'm like, it's just, those are little funny details and gags in the movie that I think are great. Um. <laughs> you, you, since you know we were talking about musical numbers um you know when elizabeth and uh frankenstein get down in the forest and you know she starts to sing, sing yeah because she is you know trained she was trained as a, an opera singer apparently they were planning on having them sing uh, or having her sing cheek to cheek from um uh, from oh, top hat oh god it, and they were no, like cheek to, isn't cheek to cheek from swing time I think it's from Top Hat. No, I don't no, know. No, it's from it's from Swing Time. Is I, it? I know, I know that because that's the only Fred Astaire, Ginger Roger movies I've seen, and it's in it's in Swing okay. Time. Okay, I'm willing to trust you. Yeah, tr- trust Dean. Ha <laughs> ha. First mistake you've made today. Oh yeah, but apparently that was the plan, and then they were like, "Yeah, this isn't gonna work." So we're gonna use this song instead because that seems more. <laughs> what's going on in the situation well, also singing cheek to cheek in that situation might be a little too on the nose Just a little a skosh a skosh on the nose but uh, god it, it I find this movie just hard to talk about because I just want to tell people, watch the movie because all the gags are way funnier than I can describe them. They are, but I mean, we have to do a, a service to it too and, you know, explain why we love it. And we have to talk about the scenes that we love. And I mean, yeah, you know, the musical number, that's a reason to watch. Uh, Frankenstein's character arc, because, you know, we have this where the audience loves him and then he freaks out over the fire and he's back. He's back to he's being the back. monster. He's back to being the monster. People are throwing vegetables at him. He's running through the streets. We get those great silhouette shots of him, you know, in the street, coming back to the castle because his theme is playing. And that's one of the great movie themes out there. And I love that it's used throughout and it's the way to control the monster. Yeah, the the violin gag. It's... That is something that feels like it is a direct reference to one of the Frankenstein movies. Because I think it was the blind man. He plays the violin. Yes, in Bride. In Bride. And it's, I like how, again, this kind of comes back around. And the music sounds like something that's in the original Frankenstein movies. But it's like an original composition. Yeah. That, again, another attention to detail for this movie. And it's uh, Frau Bluha. That is the one that plays it to get uh, Frederick down to the laboratory, where, again, we get one of the greatest gags, How I Did It, by oh. Victor Frankenstein. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Again, there's so many just good sight gags in this movie, and I like how it's like, oh, uh, how how could we possibly done it? Well, maybe this book has some answers. And it just says, How I Did It. That's the title of the book. It's... <laughs> There's just a lot of good jokes in this movie. I don't I do not know what else to tell people. If you're not convinced to see Young Frankenstein at this point, just just give yourself the service and put it on. It's not hard to find. No, it's on uh HBO Max. If you have the streaming service, watch it. I mean, yeah, there there's just, you know, hours that I could go on this movie and just say great things about it because it is a great film. It and is. it's not because, you know, I love the horror genre. It's just no, it's a well-crafted movie that understands the genre and just ran with it. Yes, and it's it's well-made, it's smartly written, it's wonderfully acted. There's real pathos to it with the with the arc of Frankenstein in this movie. And there's there's like Frank this is the only movie where Frankenstein has a happy ending. Yeah, cuz I mean, you know, speaking of pathos, you know, once we get 
Frankenstein back in the cell and Frederick's like, you know, okay, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to face my creation. And he's like, I want you to lock me in there and don't let me out. And then, you know, Frankenstein gets up, he's pissed off. And, you know, we have Frederick that's screaming and he's like, okay, let me take a different route. And he's like, you know, hello, gorgeous. And, you know, Frankenstein's looking behind him like, who are you talking to? He, he's trying to convince the Frank, the monster not to kill him by complimenting him. And he's like, you know, this is the face a mother could love. You know, you are good. And then he bursts into tears and it's the two of them sitting there hugging each other. And it's just like, you know, if uh, if Henry, if Henry had done this in Frankenstein. You know, we wouldn't have had the problems that we had. But no, you know, you create and then you throw your creation away. And then, oh, why is this creation a monster? I don't get it. It It is so interesting that this movie has a sympathetic take on, uh, the most sympathetic take yeah. on the monster. Where even the James Wales movie where he, you know, in Bride of Frankenstein, he uh, really built up the creature as a tragic figure mm-hmm. That was deserving of love, but it just could not be because of how different it was. This movie, in a very comedic way, just figures out how to make the creature um, a a good person, a a hero. Maybe not even a hero, but like. Well, he is because he protects Frederick. Because the the villagers at the end, because yes, we do have villagers in this movie. It's a Frankenstein movie. You we, need them. We have to. It comes with the contract. They're ready to kill Frederick in the in the middle of their transference. To help, you know... It was calm his his cruel mind. His, you know... What does he say? Like, sinister brain or his bro- wild... A broken brain broken or brain. something. And it's his just... His Abby normal brain. Yes, Abby normal. Abby somebody. Ha. Huh. But, you know, yeah, you know, we get that where he's... Frederick has spent his time protecting his creation, and now his creation is protecting his creator. And it's just kind of like, wow... You know, that's really insightful. And then we have them also correcting little Maria. Yeah. Where it was such a thing where, you know, Karloff fought for, please, let's not kill little Maria. And in this movie. Because like, you kill the kid in the first movie and then the monster, then the creation is a monster. Yes. Right. It's hard, it's hard to really come back after doing that. Yeah. And in this movie, it's just, you know, all right, we'll send her flying in through her room. And basically her parents are idiots, you know, Maria's gone, you know, where is she? And he's like, well, you know, did you check her room? No, did you? Well, I just assumed you did. And it's just kind of like, it's a, ah. it's a good gag. And it feels like they're going out of their way to course correct the things that made the creature um, bad yeah. in the original films or the ones that made the creature a monster. And I think that's so well done and smart because it makes it makes the ending, you know, make you feel good. You know, it's like it's a nice ending that the monster is or the creation is now just a just a worn out working stiff got married. He's reading the Wall Street Journal in bed. He's got a, a special hamper for his uh, poo poo undies. Yes. Like, you know, he's really turned it around. And it's it's like a, it's just so nice that this is the only movie in the canon that actually gives him a good ending. And you have Doctor Frankenstein who has you know taken accountability of what he's done, mm-hmm. and not only taken accountability, he is now part of his creation. Yes, where you know he takes on some of his DNA, and you know vice versa. So it's you know they are now halves of the same coin. It that's why I like this movie. If you take it as a, like a real sequel because it really does come full circle around that you know oh the the frankensteins have this curse of bringing mm-hmm. back the dead and losing control of their creation and this is like you know his they're whole... breaking the generational curse exactly and the whole thing in the movie with uh frodrick frederick mm. frederick frederick frank freddy G- dream wilder mm-hmm. his whole thing in the movie is running away from his destiny from the curse of his aunt he's just like I'm not like my grandfather before me. He was a sick, sick man. And now as the mo- as this happens and kind of comes back around on it, it's like he's breaking that family curse or he's like going against the fate of the Frankensteins. Mm-hmm. You know, we create monsters so that they can destroy us. He finally breaks that chain. And I'm like, that is like really well-made thematic filmmaking. And that's why I love this movie in the original Frankenstein canon. And we even get a bride in this movie. 
Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yeah. Madeline Kahn, top three brides of all time. She is Elizabeth in this movie. She is the fiance financier of Frederick. Yes. And she ends up with the monster in the end. And we get the, the beautiful Elsa Lanchester Hair. updo. She does the hiss. She does the... Jesus. <sighs> I mean, it's it's great. I mean, she's just such a great actress. And just to see the two of them, you know, where he is now more calmed and she's the one that's kind of off the rails and he's just sitting there with his reading glasses and his Wall Street Journal just like, oh, again, here we go. <sighs> hey, he gave her that good dick and what do you want oh, from him? Oh, God. <laughs> But yeah. Um, Seven, eight times, and then you just run off to go talk to the boys? Just like all you dirty men. <laughs> oh right. God, I think I love him. All right, all right. So, but that's Young Frankenstein, yes. in a nutshell, right? In a nutshell, yes. So, anything else you want to say about the movie before we close up on this one? Go watch it. I mean, you know. There's a reason this episode, people might not like this episode, because it just boils down to, just go watch the movie. It's Cause, great. Because, I mean, we could sit here and quote, quote, quote. But just go watch the movie. It's a 70s movie, which isn't too far away from where we are now. It's, but it, but it's a 70s movie that feels like it was made in the 30s. Yes, it's a 70s movie that feels like it's made in the 30s, that feels like it aged like a fine, fine wine. Like, none of the jokes in here are you're going to have an issue with. Everything in here just works as pure, good, old-fashioned comedy. Uh, every actor in here is giving 110%. Mel Brooks is probably at the peak of his powers here. I don't know what else there is to say about this movie. Go watch it now. Yes, go watch it. Go watch it now. But what are we watching next week? Next week, we have a bonus episode. Well, not a bonus, a guest episode. Uh, we're going to be talking about another movie near and dear to my heart, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice? Beetlejuice. Oh, no, no, he, he, okay, he, didn't, he didn't show, show up. up. Yeah. That would be that'd be really that'd be really like weird if you just said Beetlejuice three times and Michael Keaton just burst into the room. Just I, gets I would very do that angry. all the time. Uh, but yeah, so watching Beetlejuice next week. I think the last time I watched Beetlejuice, <laughs> you were five years old. It's been a minute. I was oh, pro geez. I was in middle school. Maybe it's been a long time since I've seen Beetlejuice. I have next to no memory of it. Wow. I so this was something you watch like six times a year, right? Uh, maybe twice the same with young frankenstein i watch about two times a year yeah again like i i haven't revisited this movie in such a long time i remember it i remember liking it a lot did you watch the animated series no i think i i saw some of it <clears throat> as a kid but i don't remember much about it but that's going to be interesting to talk about because what is it? That's the second uh, Tim Burton movie that spawned a whole TV show. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm going to be very interested about it because that is the movie that pretty much launched Tim Burton's career and put Michael Keaton into triple A stardom because he did that and then did Batman right after. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm very excited. Me too. But if you want to watch uh, or listen to us on a different platform, you can follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. You can go to our YouTube channel, The Film Vault. That is The Film Vault on YouTube. You can go and check out our podcast and check out the lovely slideshows I put together. Woohoo! You know, when I decide to put them up, it, I'm getting better at it. But if you want to find out when those are coming along or what we're up to, you can follow us on our social media at... The Film Club Podcast on Instagram, where we post daily stories, upcoming episodes, and random adventures we go on. And with that. Their wolf. Their castle. Why are you talking like that? I thought you wanted to. No, I don't want to. Suit yourself. I'm easy. <laughs> All right, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>